Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 10595 in the name of Siobhan Brown on Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill at stage one. Do my members wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible? And I call on Siobhan Brown to speak to and move the motion. Uh, Minister, around eight minutes, please. Presiding officer, I value greatly the law reform work that the Scottish Law Commission undertakes to simplify and improve our laws. And I remain committed to bringing forward bills to implement its recommendations. The Trusts and Succession Bill, which we are discussing here today, is the second SLC bill that this government has introduced this session. The most recent programme for government included a commitment to bring forward a third this year, and since Parliament updated its rules in 2013, this will make, make it the eighth SLC bill in this decade. I recently wrote to the Commission setting out that my officials have begun detailed work on another three SLC reports on leases, contract and cohabitation, although decisions on the legislative programme are a matter for the Cabinet to decide as part of the development of the annual programme for government. I would like to take time to thank the Scottish Law Commission for their work that they do and in, and in, the, in the case of trusts and Lord Drummond Young, who is not only the ex-chair of the SLC, but also the lead commissioner who prepared the report on trust law reform and whose recommendations this bill implements. I would also like to thank the members and clerks of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their work in scrutinising this bill and for the comprehensive and measured stage one report. I welcome the committee's agreement of the general principles of this bill. Trusts are an important legal structure in Scotland. In modern society, they are used as a solution in an incredible, incredibly wide variety of situations. And as we've all heard from the evidence given to the committee so far, they are used extensively in individual estate planning and to protect and administer the assets on behalf of vulnerable people, such as children, adults with incapacity, and for people with disabilities. They are also a legal form of many pension funds and are often used in commercial transactions to set funds aside to deal with future liabilities. Scots law has not kept up to date with the variety of ways that trusts are used. The principal trust law legislation is now over 100 years old and was drafted at a time when society was very different. The aim of the bill is to modernise the law of trusts and it takes forward all the substantive recommendations for re reform proposed by the SLC. Yes, yes, I will. Stephen Kerr. Thank the Minister for giving weight. Perhaps the Minister could address the issue that's raised by the Law Society of Scotland when they say that it's a, a missed opportunity uh, to enact legislation on the nature and constitution of trusts. They talk further about the need for legal definition and the nature of a trust in Scots law, rules for creation, special rules for trust and tr as trustees, trusts, latent trusts, etc. They've got a lot of things that they feel the bill doesn't contain. Would the Minister address why the bill as it stands does not contain any of the things the Law Society of Scotland mentions in their uh, report to all of us? Minister, I can give it back the time. Yes, I, I thank the member for the intervention and I did see that report yesterday. There's a lot in that and I will be coming on to further in the debate. Given the versatility of the trust and the uses it is put to, the bill will make sure trust law is clear, coherent and able to respond appropriately to modern conditions. Some of the key changes made by the bill include the method for appointing and removing trustees, including introducing a non-judicial method for removing trustees, reforming the powers and duties of trustees, including setting out trustees' duty of care, and a number of important powers conferred on the court, including a new power to alter trust purposes after a period of 25 years has elapsed. Stakeholders have broadly welcomed the bill and its policy intent. While many have been positive, I'm also aware that there have been points of detail raised which have been identified in the committee's report. The committee heard evidence from the, a number of academics and legal professionals about the investment power of trustees. The bill largely restates the already existing statutory investment powers of trustees and in general very wide powers of investment are conferred on trustees and these are tightly constrained by the trustees duties including their duty of care and fiduciary duties. 
Stakeholders would like to see something in the bill about the ability of trustees to reflect environmental, social and governance goals in their investment decisions. Yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for the member to give way. Um, one of the areas of concern is the interrelationship, be it either parallel with charities law or indeed where it crosses. Will you be able to deal with that in the opening as well? Minister. I, I will be coming to that. Yes. Um, sorry, uh, presiding officer. I have heard that, it, uh, ha that having an express provision would be helpful to make clear that when assessing the suitability of an investment for a trust, financial returns are not the only consideration that may be taken into account. Environmental and social impacts, for example, could also be relevant considerations, and I will consider this further looking forward to work with the committee on this matter. Another issue raised by the committee is the expenses of litigation. Awards relating to litigation expenses are at the discretion of the court. Currently, where an award is made against trustees, normally the trustee would be personally liable, but will have the right of relief against the trust estate, provided that the expenses are necessarily, properly and reasonably incurred. The bill will, or this bill will alter this. Trustees will no longer be personally liable for expenses. The court can, however, impose personal liability on trustees for those expenses in certain circumstances. This includes where the trust property is insufficient to meet the expenses of the trustee has brought about the litigation by breach of duty. As some stakeholders pointed out, trustees of underfunded trusts have an unfair advantage in raising litigation without being personally liable for expenses. The result would be that a successful litigant would be forced to meet expenses themselves. I have heard the strong statements made by the Law Society in particular that this may put people off accepting office and will act as a dissentient put them off being trustees to litigate. My officials met with them and with STEP over the summer to hear more about their concerns. And I will take this away and consider what more can be done in the bill to achieve a better balance between the personal liability of trustees and the problem of underfunded trusts litigating. Another issue which was raised by the committee is how incapable is defined in the bill. The bill takes a slightly different approach that is found in the incapacity legislation and the concern was raised that the two approaches could deviate unacceptably as future reforms are made. I recognise the problem and I thank for the committee for the work done on this matter. I will again look at this issue and consider what could be done to lessen stakeholders' apprehensions on this issue. Finally, I'd like to talk about succession because this is the Trust and Succession Bill. Two provisions on succession law are included in the bill. One is technical and is intended to clear up potential confusion with the drafting of a section in Succession Scotland Act 2016. The other is more substantive. It makes changes to the order of interstate succession so that spouse or civil partner of a person who has no children and dies without leaving a will would inherit the entire estate of the deceased person. This change reflects what many people would expect to happen already, but which is not, in fact, reflected in current law. One issue which has not been included in the bill, but which I am committed to finding a solution to, involves the circumstances where an unlawful killer is appointed to be the executor of their victim's estate. The existing law on this is unclear, which is why I instructed my officials to consult over the summer with targeted stakeholders. The aim was to test two models that may, may provide a solution to this deeply upsetting situation. It is important that whatever we take forward is capable of working in practice because we do not want the situation where the deceased estate cannot be administered or its administration is called into question. I have kept the committee up to date on this issue and I will continue to do so. Presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Stuart McMillan to speak on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, Mr McMillan, around seven minutes.
Thank you very much, Chef Senning Officer. First of all, Senning Officer, I'd like to uh, thank all those who have contributed uh, to the committee's scrutiny of the bill, whether it's in writing or appearing before the committee during one of our evidence sessions. I'd also like to thank the Minister and her officials for the evidence that they have provided uh, to the committee and also the reply uh, to our stage one report that came in yesterday, and also to the Scottish Law Commission for proposing the bill. I'd also like to thank my fellow members of the committee for their enthusiasm and tenacity in grappling with uh, some of the issues raised by the Bill. And the Minister touched upon the, uh, the, the latter point, which I will come on to later in my, uh, in my contribution, which certainly was one of those areas in particular. And finally, once again, I'd like to thank the committee officials who have uh, been excellent uh, with their assistance to us, and also I thank them for that. We are clear that the Bill proposes important reforms which will benefit people across Scotland. And as uh, we will be aware, one of the responsibilities of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is to scrutinise certain uh, Scottish Law Commission bills. And these bills can often be perceived as being quite technical. I believe that the committee's scrutiny of the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill proved to be not only interesting, but also showed the importance and the relevance of the legislation to everyone uh, living in Scotland. At the outset of the debate, it's important for the Chamber to actually consider how important both Trusts and Succession Law actually are for our constituents. A trust is a legal device for managing assets. A person, or, or to use the, the technical term, a truster, it passes assets to the trustees. Normally, this is for the benefit of individuals known as beneficiaries. Beneficiaries can include small, defined groups of indiv or individuals, or large numbers of people with, and organisations. Trusts are used frequently to help manage estates after a death by community-based groups and organisations, such as churches and charities and individuals for a whole raft of reasons. Uh, there was almost universal support for the proposed reforms in the Bill. Stakeholders reaffirmed to the Committee how important trusts actually are in Scotland. And the Scottish Law Commission uh, told us that trusts permeate Scottish society. We also heard that the reforms represent a significant improvement on existing trust law, as well, which is over 100 years old, and consequently very difficult to use and understand, particularly for lay people who actually do become trustees. Succession law, sometimes called inheritance law, sets out who should inherit, inherit someone's money, property and possessions in the event of a death, something we all know will come to every single one of us. The fairly modest provisions in the bill in front of us uh, were again generally welcomed uh, by stakeholders. Notwithstanding the support we heard in the bill, the committee also heard there was room for improvement and made a number of recommendations, some of which I'm now going to touch upon. Right. Sure. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful to the convener for giving way, and I also would like to say, personally speaking, I think we all owe your, the committee a debt of gratitude for the work that's been done on the stage one report that has been presented to Parliament. But I would like to ask uh, the convener, Deputy Presiding Officer, why it is that the committee feels, given what he has said, why a full codification of trusts, as per my earlier intervention on the Minister in respect to the Law Society of Scotland's submission to us, why that wasn't felt by the committee to be appropriate at this time? Stuart McMillan, then give you the time back. No, thank you very much. I think it's uh, uh, certainly committee members who are in the chamber. I'm sure I will stand to be corrected if I if I if I'm incorrect here. But from memory, uh, it was because of the I think the length of time and the, the challenge that that would actually uh, possess uh, for certainly for government, but also certainly for the parliament to actually get that right. Uh, there, there was no uh, shortage of will or desire for that to happen, but the length of time for that to take place uh, would certainly delay the implementation of the bill uh, that's actually going through Parliament. But as I said, uh, no doubt colleagues will correct me if I'm incorrect with that. Uh, certainly, one, uh, one, of the areas of the, uh, one such area of the, the new power in the bill for a majority of the trustees was to be able to remove another trustee on certain grounds, including where the trustee is deemed incapable. Uh, this is something the Minister uh, touched upon. Although witnesses generally supported the provision, some stakeholders told the committee that they had concerns in relation to the potential for abuse, the subjective nature of assessing incapacity, and also the burden of placing the assessment of capacity on trustees who may feel unqualified to take on that role. The committee acknowledged that, that there is a route for someone who has been deemed incapable to challenge the removal based on incapacity through the courts. However, it felt that this route might not be clear or obvious to a trustee in that particular situation. 
committee therefore hopes to see changes to the bill which would include explicit reference to the right of a trustee deemed incapable by fellow trustees to go to court to challenge the decision. The committee considered that this might be helpful to someone who finds himself in that particular situation. We also considered the point about the future-proofing of that aspect of legislation because of the, the, the different definitions of incapacity that currently exist. The committee also was able to scrutinise the bill's potential interaction with Scotland's journey to net zero. And a particular issue raised by the committee was the question on whether wording should be included in the bill to expressly permit trustees investing trust property in the absence of any relevant provision in the trust deed to choose so-called ESG investments, that's environmental, social and governance. Uh, there are, uh, these are considered to be more sustainable investment choices chosen based on their environmental, social and governance credentials, even if these might not lead to the maximum possible income for the trust. Now, one witness, Savon Evans, suggested that this would be, and I, and I quote, attractive and modern approach, supporting uh, Scotland's net zero goals through, although some witnesses uh, consider that the power may actually already exist. The committee therefore recommended the bill be amended to explicitly allow trustees, subject to the terms of the trustee, to choose to invest in ESG investments. And we look forward to working with the Scottish Government to make this happen, and certainly welcome the once again, I welcome the Minister's response uh, in this particular regard. The committee clearly heard the views of stakeholders such as the Law Society of Scotland, who expressed concerns about the, the Bill's default position on the personal liability of trustees for court expenses in cases where the trust property is insufficient to cover any such costs. And the Law Society also pointed out that, that non-recovery is a standard risk of litigation, and it was unclear why the situation should be different in litigation involving a trust compared to, for example, a company. I would like to uh, now uh, cover issues not currently included in the Bill. First, uh, firstly, in trusts, unlike the original draft bill from the Scottish Law Commission, uh, the inclusion of a pension trust in its definition of a trust it does not appear in the Bill, and this concerns some stakeholders. However, the Scottish Government has confirmed that it is in talks with the UK Government to grant an order under Section 104 of the Scotland Act 1988 to apply the changes proposed in the Bill to pension scheme trusts. And as colleagues in the committee will know, uh, I highlight this Section 104 order on a regular basis uh, because, as we had in, in the Bill Transactions Bill and also uh, this particular Bill, uh, there can be a delay between 12 and 18 months of getting that Section 104 order uh, through the system. Uh, now, I, I welcome the fact that both Scottish and UK governments are in discussions on this particular, uh, on this particular part of um, this, uh, this legislation, uh, and certainly, hopefully, that uh, would uh, progress sooner than the 12 to 18 months. The committee therefore recommended as a priority the timely implementation of the order to ensure commencement of the bill is not delayed and that there is no need for an undesirable dual operation of trust laws. Finally, turning to issues not covered in relation to succession law, some stakeholders considered the bill should be amended to clarify the law uh, that does not permit an unlawful killer to be an executor in the victim's estate. If unlawful killers are appointed as executors, even if they cannot inherit under the existing law, their continued personal contact with the victim's family under the guise of winding up the estate could be considered distressing, and it would be. The committee therefore recommended the bill is amended to clarify that the law does not permit an unlawful killer to be an executor of their victim's estate. And furthermore, the committee considered that notwithstanding the presumption of innocence, it would appear to be inappropriate for a person charged with murder or, or culpable homicide to act as an executor during the course of this prosecution. I think the committee spent a great deal of time uh, on this particular matter, presiding officer. And I think we all want to get to the same point. Uh, but, and we also recognise that is, uh, this is a very challenging aspect to get right. So, finally, if uh, this, um, uh, this bill successfully proceeds through Parliament, it will help our constituents in every single part of the country. It won't fix the problems facing many people who have been stung by the McClure solicitors fiasco, but I hope it can prevent many more people from being stung in the future uh, and also being out of pocket. So we do look forward to working with the government uh, in advance of stage two, and I do certainly commit the, commend sorry, our committee's report to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. I now call Oliver Mundell, who joins us remotely for around six minutes. Mr. Mundell.
Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start by apologising to other members for participating remotely? Um, I had planned to be in the Parliament in person, but I've had flu symptoms and a temperature uh, overnight and felt it best not to bring that into the Chamber. Uh, turning now to the bill uh, before us, um, I want to say at the offset that the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the bill at stage one at decision time and endorse the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's report. While the law affecting trusts may not be at the top of the political agenda, it's clear from the work uh, undertaken by the Scottish Law Commission, the Scottish Government and laterally by the committee itself, that after a century since the last major reforms, uh, that modernisation of the law is not only desirable, but is badly needed and broadly supported. As it stands, the bill represents a significant step forward, but there is still detailed work needed to ensure the legislation is workable and to address the concerns of key stakeholders. The committee identified uh, that too, uh, that there is still work outstanding on a number of the areas of the bill um, and agreed uh, that it was sympathetic with concerns raised by stakeholders in both parts one and two of the bill. Uh, more generally, um, as I also pressed the Minister on at committee, there is a feeling in some quarters, especially in the context of having waited 100 years, that the bill is a missed opportunity to do more, uh, particularly when it comes to maximising the codification of trust law. Um, my colleague Stephen Kerr um, asked a question uh, to the convener of the committee um, about why uh, the committee was content to proceed with the bill uh, when, when concerns have been, been raised on this. Um, and part of the reason uh, for, for doing so was, as uh, Stuart McMillan said, uh, because of the delays it would have uh, caused uh, to, to, to start substantive new work uh, on the bill. Uh, but also um, there was strong evidence from a number um, of uh, witnesses, um, that, including from the SLC, uh, that uh, there are areas of trust law which are not settled um, and where the case law is not sufficiently established um, to support uh, full codification. Uh, but I, I myself um, remained uh, keen uh, that we saw more uh, codification and I know uh, what the Scottish Law Society say um, in their briefing ahead of today's debate, um, arguing um, that uh, there could be uh, more uh, on the nature and constitution of trusts. Um, and I would be interested, uh, like uh, the Law Society, to hear more from the Scottish government uh, on what other options um, it's looking at to take this work forward outside of the bill um, to help, in particular, uh, define different types of trusts. And I'd be keen to hear more from the Minister on that in closing. Moving on now to some of the particular issues that need further attention. Um, and let me be clear, while this is an SLC uh, bill, um, it's important uh, that... I'm keen to take the intervention, if that's possible. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful to the member to give way. And with regard to the question of charities that I raised earlier, does he have concerns about the challenge that some charities, which so many of which are fundamentally based on trusts, that some elements of the current proposed bill may cause confusion? Oliver uh, Mundell. Uh, yes, I, I do share that concern, and it's something that the committee I thought about I, and I know other members of the committee are concerned about too. Um, it's a complicated landscape, and that's why one of the key recommendations in our report is making sure that there's good guidance uh, available, recognising the fact that many people involved in trusts, um, you know, do so as volunteers, um, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, come come to the law, uh, you know, w without a kind of detailed experience and understanding and anything uh, that the government can do to 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 help provide that clarity. Uh, moving forward, I think is really important. Um, moving on uh, to some of the, the kind of key uh, issues, um, and while it's an SLC bill, I think it's important the Scottish Government and the Minister uh, take ownership uh, over it uh, to ensure uh, that the concerns and suggested improvements which have come to light through the parliamentary process are acted upon, uh, fully considered, uh, and where possible, uh, are incorporated into a strengthened final bill. I think it's tempting to think uh, it all falls back uh, on the SLC uh, or on others, uh, but I'm pleased um, that as we uh, see the Minister's response to, to the Stage 1 report, 
uh, the Scottish Government uh, seem to be taking an active interest um, in resolving some of the, the committee's concerns. Um, I know the Minister has touched upon uh, Section 65 in her own uh, remarks uh, regarding litigation expenses, uh, but I just wanted to re-emphasise uh, you know, fr from uh, the committee's report and, and from my own position uh, that, that concerns do, do continue uh, and you know the, the law society uh, have been quite um, outspoken in this in their original response. Uh, they stated that this is quite a radical provision. Uh, there are real issues uh, with the default uh, being that that trustees personally pick up the liability for expenses with a trust property is insufficient unless they can show that that would be unfair. This may put people off accepting office and will more than likely be a disincentive for trustees to litigate. This gives me cause for concern on two grounds. Firstly, I'm not sure that SLC bills are the place for radical provisions and major departures from existing practice. I'm, I'm also concerned uh, about the practical implications uh, this may have um, with many uh, individual trustees left potentially protecting uh, their own financial interests rather than doing what's best for the trust. I understand there's a fine balance to be struck, but I believe this section of the bill needs further work and clarification, and I welcome the confirmation that the Minister is considering this and hope that the Government brings forward amendments at stage two uh, to make the provision uh, absolutely clear. Um, I would also be keen to understand the evidence of underfunded trusts entering into litigation um, and to get a sense of how much of a real problem this is at present. Uh, that, that's something I've, I've not seen um, and, and, and not heard uh, any real uh, evidence of. I'd also like to draw the Minister's attention to Section uh, 61 uh, and the 25-year limit. Um, again, I was pleased uh, to see the Government welcome the Committee's recommendation and understand that this is being considered with a view to bring forward an amendment at Stage 2 regarding the circumstances in which an application can be made to the court. Uh, while a range of views were expressed, the committee agreed on balance that the 25-year period in the bill is appropriate, um, but we stated that we would like to see a caveat added, which would allow the court uh, to permit alteration of the 25-year period in exceptional circumstances. This would enable the law to capture those circumstances, for example, uh, which were not reasonably foreseeable at the time the trust was created, and which are detrimental to the operation of the trust. This to me seems pragmatic and would strengthen the bill. Finally, on specifics, I also want to flag up ongoing concerns about incapacity. I know this has already been mentioned uh, by, by the convener and touched on by the minister, uh, but how it's defined in the bill and how things will work in practice uh, definitely remain uh, ongoing concerns. Um, and I'm sure other members will cover this in further detail. But I'm very clear uh, amendments are needed here if we're going to have confidence that we've got this legislation right. So in closing, Presiding Officer, I would commend the Committee's Stage 1 report, which covers these and many other aspects of the Bill in much greater detail than I've managed to do in the time allotted today. What's clear is we have an important and much needed piece of legislation in front of us. And I'm hopeful that through stage two and stage three, we can get to a point where we can all be confident in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. And I now call Michael Mara around five minutes, Mr Mara. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour welcomes the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill and is grateful to the Scottish Law Commission for its body of work but on both trusts and succession. Uh, those in the legal profession have had to work around the complexities and more arcane aspects of the Trusts Act 1921 uh, for many decades. And uh, a new act which reforms and clarifies some aspects of the law relating to trusts for the 21st century is most welcome. We are grateful to the many representatives of the legal profession who gave evidence to this effect at committee. And can I also place on record uh, my thanks and uh, Labour's thanks to members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their scrutiny of the bill thus far. Uh, while the bill was broadly supported by stakeholders and indeed by the committee, there do remain questions for the Minister and her government to answer with regard to the Trust's reforms. Uh, given that inconsistencies with the 2000 Adults with Incapacity Act were noted, will changes be made to the definition of incapacity? And I uh, would love some clarity in that area. What clarifications will be provided on trustees' duties to provide information 
and exactly what information must they provide. And I welcome the confirmation from the Minister that she would ask the UK Government for a Section 104 order so that pensions could be included in the scope of the Bill. Uh, in the event that the Bill passes, um, I would urge both Governments to work constructively uh, to that end. Um, President Officer, too often good governance suffers in this country from the inability of the Scottish Government and the UK Government to put aside political grievance and work together to the better ends uh, of, of all Scots. Um, and in this case, I hope that is not uh, that what happens. If we are able to pass a bill into legislation uh, which provides a single coherent statute on trusts, we will have served not just the legal profession, but all of those who make use of trusts well. There has been some comment, uh, commentary so far on just the great extent to which citizens um, uh, rely and institutions rely on trusts across Scotland. Uh, so regarding succession, the reforms included in the bill are also certainly welcome. It is right that the bill takes cognizance of modern attitudes. Uh, when a person dies intestate and without children, the bereaved spouse or civil partner should inherit their estate. And at a time of great loss, the law should not be adding to the burden of the bereaved. As the Law Society ra uh, raised, there remain some uncertainties regarding what happens if a person dies intestate while separated from their spouse or civil partner. And it would be helpful if the Minister could provide further clarity on the Government's position in that matter. It is clear that there is still work to be done on this Bill uh, for it to be a comprehensive piece of legislation on trusts and succession. Um, my, uh, the, our colleague Stephen Kerr has already raised those issues um, as uh, raised by the Law Society of Scotland. Um, Spice also pointed out that part two of the Bill would still leave much of the Scottish Law Commission's work to date on succession law unimplemented. Uh, in 2020, the Scottish Government said it would legislate at, and I quote, at the next available legislative opportunity on banning a person convicted of unlawful killing from being an executor of their victim's will. And in February of this year, the Scottish Government reiterated its commitment to that reform. Um, I was glad to hear the Minister in her opening statement acknowledging that, that, that the bill as it stands does not put that scenario beyond doubt and that there is, uh, also, there is a, a clear opportunity here to make good on the commitments of the government and to put that in place. Uh, during scrutiny of the bill, the Minister told uh, the committee that she would explore what could be done in that context uh, to ensure that there is that clarification of the law. And again, she has reiterated that today. Um, I believe Stuart McMillan made strong comments uh, on this issue, and I think we would be broad support if we could make sure that that was dealt with. Uh, while the number of cases may be small, I'm sure we can all agree that such a situation would be intolerable for a family and loved ones uh, of a victim. Uh, so I would urge the government to remove this cruel and untenable anomaly of our legal system without delay. So I look forward to the rest of the debate. Uh, Labour supports the bill and its, uh, the uh, principles of the bill as it stands, um, but we believe that there is scope for further amendment and look forward to other members' contributions. Thank you, Mr Mara. Uh, before we move to the uh, open debate, just a gentle reminder that members participating in the debate do need to remain in the chamber, both for the opening speeches and the closing speeches. I call first Bill Kidd to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Around four minutes, Mr Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. I don't even know it will take that, but I'll try. Um, thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, it's a pleasure to speak today and ask that Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill at Stage 1. In our Stage 1 deliberations, members of the committee broadly welcomed the bill and, in our report, noted that there was widespread support for the bill from stakeholders, acknowledging in particular the importance of trusts in Scotland uh, alongside the need for the law to be modernised. As we've heard, our statutory law on the management and administration of trusts is now over 100 years old and has its roots in a very different era from now. It is clear the law in this area has not kept pace with how society has changed and developed, and this bill will bring the current legislation into the 21st century. Of course, whilst we are supportive of the aims of the bill, we also listen to concerns raised by stakeholders and I'm confident that our approach to the bill at stage two will address many of these concerns. Specific concerns were raised regarding the bill's potential interaction with Scotland's journey to net zero, and I can assure stakeholders that the committee looks forward to addressing these concerns by working with the Scottish Government to amend the bill to explicitly allow trustees, subject to the terms of the trust deed, 
to choose to invest in ESG investments. We also heard concerns raised by stakeholders about the Bill's default position on the personal liability of trustees for court expenses in cases where the trust property is insufficient to cover any such costs. And our view is that the starting point should be that there is no personal liability on the part of trustees for expenses unless deemed otherwise by the court and look forward to discussions with the Scottish Government regarding considerations as to whether such an amendment is required to reflect this. One issue of possible concern that is currently not covered by the Bill, but that I would like to mention for the record, is that of the need for the inclusion of a pension trust in its definition of a trust. In this regard, we urge the Scottish Government and the UK Government to grant a Section 104 order to apply the changes proposed in the, in the Bill to pension scheme trusts. And we hope that the Scottish Government and UK Government will work in close collaboration to this end in order to ensure smooth enactment of the Bill. To conclude, President Officer, I want to end by re-emphasising what the Convener, Stuart McMillan, said. Although the Trust and Succession Scotland Bill is a technical bill, I hope members will agree that the Committee's scrutiny has shown it to be anything but dull. Instead, we have shown that the Bill has proven to be an interesting and important piece of legislation, one that proposes to modernise the existing outdated trust legislation. We are clear the Bill proposes important reforms which will benefit people across Scotland. And we look forward to working with the Scottish Government on the issues that I have outlined and more in advance of Stage 2. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Kidd. I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Keith Brown around four minutes. Mr Kerr. I've, always put it on, I've already put it on the record that I'm grateful to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their Stage 1 report. Um, on the surface of things, this does seem like a technical bill. And while I've uh, had to deal with lawyers professionally throughout my career, um, before I got into politics, I am no lawyer. And that said, however, technical it may be, it is in a subject area of the greatest importance to the people of Scotland. And it relates in part to an experience that's already been mentioned that we will all have sooner or later. And we should not resist, this is my basic contribution to this debate, we should not resist the common sense of the people of Scotland when it comes to the law. In this area of the law, many people carry with them a perceived sense of what they feel is right. And sometimes it isn't right. So we, we should listen as carefully, in my view, to the common sense of our constituents in matters such as these as we do the legal counsel of esteemed and learned lawyers. And I would like to think the passage of this bill presents us with an opportunity to encourage everyone in Scotland to make a will. Because there are complexities and unexpected legal hoops to go through when someone dies without having set out their last will and testament. And when it comes to making a law, Scots law is based in good old-fashioned popular common sense. But when there isn't a will, it is far less straightforward and the way more unpredictable than most people are expecting. People assume that when they die or their spouse or partner dies, their other half will inherit their estate. People assume that when assets in a trust are divided in favour of the trustees, that the trust can easily be wound up. People assume that when their spouse is incapacitated, that they will be able to act on their behalf in financial and other matters. People assume that the law on such matters will be straightforward, accessible, and easily understood. Common sense is not always reflected in the law. Of course, the law should be kept current and relevant. That's why I am glad that the Conservatives are supporting this bill at stage one. As it happens, the law in the areas of this bill it seems to become rather untidy and far from accessible. But I don't shy away from saying that we should consider the law in the context of what the people consider to be within the scope of their expectations. In other words, what people consider to be sensible and reasonable. So we should have law, as in the instance of this bill, that is clear and understandable. That is what I mean when I say, and I think other members mean, when we use the word accessible. That reflects the fairness that people expect. 
It shouldn't require payments of thousands of pounds to expensive lawyers to unravel and explain. It should, in short, be user-friendly. The provisions of the bill... Yes, of course. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Stephen Kerr giving way, and I um, wholeheartedly agree with much about what he's saying. My only question is, is, does he still have confidence that the present bill that sits before us, which comes under the Scottish Law Commission, does so under its special procedure that there is um, non-controversial elements to it? Does he feel that his request perhaps gets close to the boundary of potential controversiality, which may require a different approach by this place? Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful for that intervention. In fact, I don't think there's anything terribly controversial in what I'm saying. I think what I'm addressing is the expectations that people have about how the law operates in situations where they go through the loss of a loved one. Their expectations are often founded on the basis of what they think is reasonable and right, but the law doesn't necessarily provide them with uh, accessibility when it comes to these matters. The provisions of the bill seem to attempt to consolidate and simplify elements of trust law. The provisions of section 72, I would call out, are a step in the right direction, but I retain some concerns. But when someone in your close family dies, it is a time for grief. As the late Queen famously said, grief is the price we pay for love. For, for all of us as human beings, the process of grieving is important and needs to be handled with compassion and with understanding. Expecting those who are grieving to grapple with complex legal issues is unreasonable. And we should seek to reduce that burden of complexity in this bill. Changing the law... Yes. Stuart McMillan. I thank Stephen Kerr for taking the intervention. Just to, I'd like to reassure Mr Kerr that uh, during the, uh, our deliberations in committee, I mean, that particular point came up. Uh, and also because it is, uh, the bill is suggested for six months. So we did make a recommendation in our stage one report for that to be extended uh, in particular circumstances because of the, the, the points that Mr Kerr is actually raising. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful for that intervention and welcome uh, what the convener has reported. Um, changing the law to ensure that estates are inherited by the spouse when there is no will and no children is a welcome reform. That being said, there is still room for ambiguity if the relationship is broken or has been broken for some time. A former partner, for example, uh, should not have priority over children. There is an opportunity here that we are perhaps wasting, as I alluded to in my interventions on the Minister, to do the full and serious reform that I think we acknowledge needs to be done. But the number one thing that I would like to say in my speech that I hope is a contribution to the broader public's awareness of this bill is that people should make wills and that those who don't have a will need to make a will so that they have a more clear and unambiguous route to resolving these matters. Presiding officer, I will include. I, make, I may make myself unpopular with some of my colleagues in this chamber when I say that the involvement of lawyers in my experience often brings with it a burden of complexity and cost that very often doesn't need to exist at all. We should trust the people through good and simple law to use their common sense. The law as passed in this parliament should back the people up in doing the right things and in meeting their expectation of right outcomes. I hope the scrutiny of this bill at stage two is rigorous to make this bill fit for the expectations of the common sense of the Scottish people. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I now call Keith Brown to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Around four minutes, Mr Brown. Uh, hey, thank you, President Officer. And can I just reassure uh, Stephen Kerr, I think it's very unlikely he'll make himself <laughs> any less popular than he currently is. Um, but can I also say I do agree with the central point he made, at least one of them, which was when we do this kind of reform, we really should have an idea on what's important to local people. And this touches on some of the most intimate affairs of the general population. And it shouldn't be shrouded behind legalese or legal access. It should be as accessible as possible. Having said that, I support the, the bill. Uh, it sits comfortably in the Western European tradition of economic affairs taking place 
in an organised setting, and both trusts and clearly defined rules on inheritance and succession have been a part of Scottish life for centuries. And today, many people across Scotland are either connected to a trust or are themselves a trustee uh, and matters of inheritance and succession are dealt with across Scotland on a daily basis. This shows that while this is a largely technical piece of legislation, it is an important one for many Scots. And to go back to the point that uh, Stephen Kerr made about how, making sure it's accessible as possible, uh, another example in the criminal law would be the, the idea of not proven, where not proven um, sheriffs and judges are not allowed to explain the implications of a not proven verdict, which is the reason why I changed my mind on the uh, abolition of not proven. If you cannot explain to the public a principle of law, that is not accessible. So I think it is very important to make this as accessible as possible. Uh, as has been said before, the main piece of existing legislation in trusts date back to 1921, making the law effectively over 100 years old. And of course, the language in the 1921 Act is challenging and outdated, but the numerous amendments to this legislation since then make it immensely challenging for trust creators, trustees and other beneficiaries to understand their rights and responsibilities within the system. To put it simply, our society has changed, but our trust laws have struggled to change with it. And let's not forget that trusts are not only about financial matters, they are used extensively by charitable organisations and pension funds. They can be used to protect and administer assets on behalf of vulnerable people and to streamline business operations by setting funds aside to deal with potential future liabilities. And in an ever-changing world, the trust law must therefore be robust, adaptable and, above all, comprehensible as well as accessible. Therefore, one of the main purposes of this bill is to modernise, centralise and clarify the rules on trusts in Scotland by creating a single accessible statute which will ensure that both individuals and professionals can navigate the law on trusts with confidence. In short, the bill offers the Parliament an opportunity to make the lives of everyday Scots just that bit easier. However, the bill is not only about updating the law and trusts, it's also about modernising and clarifying the rules on succession and inheritance. And just for the record, I am totally opposed to the proposed changes to inheritance tax, which the UK government is currently talking about. Inheritance is primarily a matter for families and relationships, and just as the role of trusts have changed since 1921, so too have many of the societal norms relating to families and relationships. So the bill aims to update the law on succession in line with these societal changes. And the proposed simplification to succession rules is a testament to this. We recognise the changing role of spouses and civil partnerships in our society, and it is important, therefore, that the law should acknowledge them as key members of the deceased's family in the new definitive statute that the Bill proposes. And further to this, the Bill also proposes a more equitable approach to biological, adopted and stepchildren in the event of the death of a parent. And this is also a much needed change. The bill is a product of two large-scale law reform projects undertaken by the Scottish Law Commission, and this has spanned over a decade and involved extensive consultations, discussions and reports. Its aim is clear to ensure that our Scottish law and trust and succession is coherent and adaptable to the modern world. In conclusion, the Trust and Succession Scotland Bill is a significant piece of legislation that updates our legal framework with the needs of our modern society and makes this readily accessible to the public. It simplifies trust laws, ensures clarity for stakeholders, and it acknowledges the changing dynamics of our families. So I would urge all my fellow parliamentarians to support this bill, recognising that its passage will benefit not just us today, but generations still to come. Thank you, Mr Brown. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Willie Coffey. Around four minutes, Mr Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. And just as a, a point of clar clarification and declaration, I am in fact a um, charitable trustee of a charity that is not actually based in Scotland, but I put that on the record, although I receive no remuneration for it. It's a great pleasure to follow Keith Brown, who, of course, um, sailed this bill into the Parliament back in 2022, and I endorse much um, of what he has said. I would like to take the relatively short time that I have to discuss the question of the interface between charities and indeed this proposed bill, and in particular, obviously, rather than the succession element of it, with regard to the fact of trusts. Um, and trusts do form a vehicle that charities frequently use. Um, there are a significant number of charitable trustees across Scotland, many of them volunteers, who's, which has already been pointed out, I think, by the, the convener of the committee. And can I give my admiration to the convener and the committee for the work they've done, and in particular, the preparation of the report. 
There are um, some fundamental charitable pieces of legislation, and indeed the most recent, the Regulation and Administration Scotland Act, the 2023 Act, came about during the time that the committee, in fact, was overseeing this bill. Um, and so I do have questions which I hope the Minister can answer with regard to the interplay um, and the consideration that's been given between charities and indeed this bill. And I do so because I think the role of charities at this time, particularly with the economic crisis that um, so many people are facing and the roles, I think, of our food banks, I think of those groups built into our communities that help and support people, that the role and responsibilities of charities is ever increasing. And indeed, we should look forward to it, we should celebrate it, but most of all, we should support it. And that hints at the concern that I have in relation to the present legislation. Concern not about what the proposed legislation would say, but more about the explanation. There has been um, a metaphor given that these are railway tracks that run parallel. So the charitable legislation is running parallel with the proposed um, bill that we have before us today. But I am not as convinced, and indeed some of the evidence that the committee heard, um, there are others outside of this place, that are not as convinced that actually that's a perfect parallel. Different language is used. We've heard about the origins um, of the Trust Act here over 100 years ago. And indeed, the passage of time means descriptions are often different. But I think it's in that minutiae that there is the potential of risk, particularly for our charitable trustees. I very much welcome the response from the Minister to the Committee for their Stage 1 report, particularly regarding paragraphs 102 and 103 of the report. Um, I see that the Government are going to um, expand on the explanatory note um, to reach the Committee's request to have uh, a better explanation of how the various powers that sit within OSCA, the charity regulator here in Scotland, the, charity, the two principal charitable acts here in Scotland, and this bill will interact. And I think that's an incredibly useful um, proposal to make, because I think in doing that, we may be able to tease out any challenges that potentially could come down the line. I'm slightly more disappointed at the government's response to paragraph 103, where the committee requested an update of the Scottish Government on how the provisions of the Charities Regulation Administration Scotland Act um, will interact with the Bill. There is a very strong description, which I understand, and value of OSCAR and the powers that OSCAR has in emergency situations to appoint trustees, but there is a potential for a challenge there. Um, and I would do just at this stage, because I fully support the principles of this, to seek an undertaking um, from the Minister in winding up that this will be looked at and we will be able to see evidence of the work that's done that I think will reassure a significant number of charities that are outside of this place. I recognise time is tight. Can I welcome the work that has been done? And can I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for your patience? Thank you very much indeed, Mr Whitfield. I now call uh, Willie Coffey to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Around four minutes, uh, Mr Thanks Coffey. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. The first thing I want to do is to thank the Committee for the considered and detailed work they've carried out at Stage 1, which seeks to update the law on two important areas of Scottish life, the management of and administration of trusts, and the law as it relates to succession. I'd like to focus on part two of the bill that relates to succession and to share with the Parliament some views on the benefits of the proposals relating to the rights of spouses and civil partners. And what was and still is an area where a lack of clarity remains with respect to the appointment of executors of a deceased person's estate. Firstly, in the proposals themselves concerning how to deal with intestate succession, the problem of what happens when a person dies without leaving a will. Currently, the range of beneficiaries are spouses or civil partners, children and remote descendants like grandchildren and even the parents of the deceased. Section 72 of the Bill, as I understand it, proposes that the spouse or civil partner will become top of the statutory list of those entitled to inherit the free estate. That proposal seems to have been met with agreement from all those consulted and appears to be uncontested. If that proposal goes forward to the final Bill, I'm sure that will be broadly welcomed. An issue arose in relation to the complexities that may arise in dealing with separated partners presiding officer. But the government suggests that there remains the ability of a partner to change their will and doesn't see the need to alter the legislation in respect of this, despite the discussion that occurred 
that committee. Uh, a word of caution, perhaps, in the succession debate, too, is that cohabitants are not part of the suite of possible inheritors and must make a separate application to the court to be considered to be a beneficiary. It can be done, but requires court action on the part of the individual. Perhaps all of that, presiding officer, strengthens the advice to make a will that we heard earlier from Stephen Kerr. One important area that was discussed by the committee and for which some further work is probably required is in the case where unlawful killers can currently become executors of a deceased person's estate. I know only too well from constituency casework of the anguish that this brings to the family of a loved one, murdered by a person who then becomes the executor of the estate. Whilst a murderer cannot benefit directly from such an act, the role of an executor is a separate matter which can at the very least cause prolonged delay and at worst a refusal to dispose of the estate. Application can be made to a court to remove executors, but we all know this can be extremely costly and usually does not proceed. So I am pleased to see that the government is committed to bringing forward the necessary reforms that would prevent a person convicted of murder from being an executor to their victim's estate. Yes, thanks. Stuart McMillan. I thank Willie Coffey for taking the intervention. I think Mr Coffey would uh, recognise the, the, the challenge that, that does exist, uh, certainly with the present law, but also going forward. Uh, because if somebody actually was a trustee uh, uh, before uh, they were then convicted, uh, then they still are that trustee. So it's about, uh, about trying to get a, a balance of what we all want to see happen to protect trusts uh, and also uh, the beneficiaries of trusts. Uh, but at the same time, there is also that uh, presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Willie Coffey. Absolutely, and I think what the conveners explained there, uh, presiding officer, is how tricky and difficult this matter still remains. But I am pleased to hear that the government is working on this, and hopefully we will see that coming through stages two and three. I also hope that this will prevent any circumstances in the future where a murderer can indirectly benefit from the future sale of his victim's property, and I think that is absolutely crucial. Uh, whether this can be achieved within the timescales for this bill is not clear, and perhaps the Minister could say a little more about that in her summing up. Presiding officer, in winding up my comments in this short debate, I would simply like to finish with a, a positive comment for the careful consideration given to the issues highlighted by the committee. These issues are not as straightforward as it might seem to some, and perhaps the hundred years or so that has passed with no changes to some aspect of this might attest to that. Hopefully, though, it won't be another 100 years before we see some of these positive changes coming into effect. And, of course, a resolution to the awful circumstances I've just outlined. So I wish the committee every success as it considers these important issues at stages two and three. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Coffey. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Emma Harper. Around four minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to begin by thanking the Scottish Law Commission for their detailed work over more than a decade on the different elements of this bill. I'm also very grateful to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their consideration of these proposals over the last few months. The evidence gathered in the Stage 1 report has been very useful to me as I try to get my head around at least some of what is in this legislation. Scottish Greens welcome this legislation. As we've heard, it's a technical bill that seeks to deal with the complexities that over 100 years of acts, amendments and the like have created. It's intended to ensure that our laws on trusts and succession are clear, coherent and able to respond appropriately to contemporary and hopefully future conditions and requirements. It should make it easier for solicitors but perhaps more importantly for trusters, trustees and beneficiaries to understand what their legal rights and duties are. And it clarifies, among other things, the rights of spouses or civil partners of people who die without having written a will. There are several things that I will watch with interest over the coming stages of this bill. Comments made by witnesses about what needs clarification or amendment, uncertainties about how this legislation will interact with charity law, concerns regarding pension scheme trusts, among others. And of course, I welcome the committee's recommendation that the, that the Scottish and UK governments pursue the timely implementation of a Section 104 order to ensure commencement of this bill is not delayed. 
But I want to say just a couple of things about issues that this bill does not cover. Things that might be out of scope at this moment, but issues that I hope the committee will have in mind as the bill progresses through the next stages to see if there are things that can be considered or at least have the foundation set for future work. I do note the comments by the Minister in her opening statement about the further work that should be possible to ensure trusts support positive environmental and social objectives to enhance our environment and community well-being. I'm grateful for these comments and I look forward to developments in these areas. But specifically on landholding trusts, Scottish Greens believe that offshore trusts, blind trusts and private trusts that exist for tax avoidance or ownership secrecy should be prohibited from holding land. Further, primary beneficiaries of landholding trusts should demonstrate the productive use or development of land for good while being to locally accountable and accessible. We must also ensure that our succession laws support our intentions and principles around collective benefit and fair inheritance of land holdings practices and do not contribute further to Scotland's land problem. Many of us in this chamber are concerned about the historic inequalities that are embedded in the structures and concentrated patterns of land ownership. We must not forget the powers within succession laws as we look to further land reform for community benefit. But I realise, presiding officer, that these points are perhaps beyond the technical parameters of the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill we discussed today. I do hope, however, that the DPLR committee will have these points in mind over the coming months. So in closing, presiding officer, can I thank the Law Society and all others for their, for their contributions to Parliament's scrutiny and debate of this bill to date and wish the DPLR committee well as it continues its work on this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Emma Harper, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome this debate at stage one, and I wish Oliver Mundell a, swish, a swift recovery, and I hope he feels better soon. Um, I also would like to thank the DPLR committee, the clerks, and all others for their input so far. Scots trust law is widely considered to be out of date and the main legislation is now just over a century old, dating back to 1921. And trust law is widely understood, including by the legal profession, to be complex, difficult to understand, cumbersome and opaque. So I therefore welcome that this bill will simplify trust legislation, making the process easier and simpler for all involved and accessible, which members have talked about already. President Officer, the Bill will bring the current legislation into the 21st century. In a modern society, trusts are used as solutions in an incredibly wide variety of situations. They are used extensively by charities and pension funds, as others have mentioned already, in commercial transactions to set funds aside to deal with future liabilities and in individual estate planning. Trusts are also used to protect and administer assets on behalf of vulnerable people such as children and adults with incapacity and disabilities. Although I know, um, I know this through my own casework, that trusts are also important to look after community assets and funds, as well as for matters which may not automatically spring to mind. For instance, I have a constituent who told me about the importance of this bill for her, and she and her husband use a trust to secure financial assets for their child who is in the custodial estate. And that rela uh, relates to Keith Brown's point about vulnerable people. So trusts are indeed hugely important. However, presiding officer, the state of trust law in Scotland at present is inaccessible and off putting. Those who have had experience of these difficulties are re reluctant to create new trusts, even if a trust represents the best option to provide the flexibility and protection sought. As reported by the Scottish Law Society, this inertia around trusts in Scotland is putting Scotland at a disadvantage in contrast to other European nations and indeed other parts of the UK. These issues are all ones that the Scottish Law Commission, the Law Society of Scotland and practitioners have commented on throughout the various consultations that led to this Trust and Succession Bill. Indeed, I echo the comments of Lady Patton of Inner House of the Court of Session, who said there will be considerable considerable rejoicing and relief amongst the legal community who deal with clients and find the 100-year-old law a major handicap. So we are moving in the right direction with this bill. 
presiding officer, as a healthcare professional and a member of the Health Committee, I am particularly interested in the provisions of the Bill in relation to incapacity. Under Section 3 of the 1921 Act, all trusts are held to include the provision that decisions must be made by quorum, which is defined as a majority of the trustees accepting and surviving. This, however, does not include incapacitated trustees. This can lead to issues where trust decisions cannot be made if a majority cannot be achieved. The new Trust Bill addresses this, and a definition of incapable is in, included within the Bill at Section 76, which closely reflects the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2001 and refers to whether a person is capable of making, communicating, understanding and retaining the memory of decisions. In addition, Section Section 12 of the Bill now states that trustees' decisions are to be made by a majority of those for the time being able to make it, and that a trustee is not to be regarded as able to make a decision who is incapable. This, therefore, means capacity can be determined on a decision-specific basis, allowing incapax trustees to continue as trustees and participate where appropriate without hindering the administration of the trust. Um, and I appreciate the comments made by the Minister regarding incapacity and the commitment to look further at this issue of capacity or incapacity to, present, uh, to prevent abuse. So, presiding officer, in closing, this bill will improve Scots law in relation to trusts, and it's one which I urge members to support this evening at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. And we move to winding up speeches, and I call on Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to all members who have contributed to the debate this afternoon. Um, I think it has been peppered through with uh, clarion calls for clarity um, in, in our law in, in this area, and I think that that's something that has been unanimity around uh, the Chamber on. Um, and also the importance of this area of law, the legal devices by which estates, as well as one example, are passed, uh, and is indeed to, important to many people across Scotland. Uh, there are many people who uh, place property or assets and trusts uh, without any real clarity as to whether that is necessary. Uh, it incurs them at great and considerable cost, um, and it's, it's, it's far from clear at the moment as to whether that's something, a step that they should actually take. So an emerging clarity in this area, I think, would be welcomed by uh, many people uh, for the purpose of good law and uh, the better ends to which Maggie Chapman um, alluded to in, in her speech. Um, Stuart McMillan, I think, was, was started by telling us all that, just how widespread um, this issue was and how many people and institutions um, it, it touched upon. Uh, and I thought that Stephen Kerr's uh, contribution at that point about asking about the full codification uh, of trusts was a very reasonable uh, point made on, uh, partly on behalf of the Law Society of Scotland who have called on it. And I'm not entirely sure that I, I would agree with, uh, I think, the, kind of the principal objection to that, that it would take a lot of time uh, to act on, on that. Uh, and I'll come on to my concerns uh, within that. Um, I mean, for, for instance, I, I think you know, we have a, a debate next week on protecting um, this parliament, um, taking up a considerable amount of chamber uh, time, um, nothing more than political point scoring and posturing ahead of a by-election. Um, and I would say that uh, the, the, delay, uh, the delay on the work uh, of this bill um, would, I, I think, is, is, uh, is, is rather um, indefensible in in that regard, in terms of chamber time. But I'm aware that this, the background to this bill takes a considerable amount of work from a lot of different institutions. I would say that the people who are using this law have waited a century for it to be reformed. Um, and I would ask that perhaps you know, slightly more delay might, uh, in resulting in a better outcome would be worth considering. We have had, of course, 16 years um, of this government. Um, uh, Oliver Mundell uh, also uh, uh, stood by my colleague Martin Whitfield's concerns around the, the problems and looking for, um, for the, around the clarification they want to see between trusts and charities. And it is difficult to see how this might be fully resolved without that full codification that the Law Society of Scotland uh, are looking for. Um, but I believe, do believe in the Minister, I would appreciate clarification or uh, work from the Minister uh, to set out Martin Whitfield's suggestions of looking for a prioritisation of definitions as a useful step in that 
direction about uh, which, uh, how we can resolve this, this confusion. Um, because I do think that there is that broader point to be made about the debate today, uh, President Officer, and, and this legislation. Um, and frankly, uh, the work of government uh, that, that people are elected to do in this place and the, uh, holding them to account as we are as a parliament. Um, as I stated in my uh, opening remarks, the Scottish Law Commission does deserve recognition for the wide body of work that it has uh, produced. But it, it deserves more than that. It deserves that work to be acted upon. Um, um, and they could be forgiven for being more than a little frustrated at the numbers of reports and draft bills they've published, which sit, which sit gathering dust on the shelf in St Andrew's House. Uh, part one of the bill we're debating today is based on a Scottish Law Commission report from 2014 and a revised draft bill from 2018. Uh, the reforms contained in Part 2 are the fruit of law reform work and public consultation spanning over 30 years. Um, while well, the main recommendations were contained in a 2009 report on succession from the Scottish Law Commission. Indeed, the Scottish <coughs> Government consulted on those recommendations back in 2015, certainly. Stuart McMillan. I thank Michael Mara for taking the intervention. Uh, but, uh, Michael Mara uh, welcomed the comments from the Minister of Parliamentary Business at the Delegated Powers Committee on Tuesday and also the First Minister yesterday at the Conveners Group, where they both gave commitments regarding SLC bills, one of them to come into the Parliament. Michael Mara. I, I, I certainly welcome that. It's, um, I think it's, it's belated and it's been a, lo a long time coming. And I'll come on to why I think this is, is particularly important. It's good to see the government spending more of its time on the job of governing, frankly. Um, the, the more of that that we could have, uh, the better. We, so we believe it's a good thing that the government is, is keeping that commitment to implementing some of these recommendations. Um, we only wish it had not taken quite so long. But back in 2021, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee raised the slow rate of progress with the Minister for Parliamentary Business. And at that time, there were around 18 Scottish Law Commission reports going back as far as 2006, presiding officer, on which no legislation had been passed at all. Uh, and there has, of course, been some progress, as we've uh, mentioned. The Movable Transactions Bill passing into law earlier this year is a good example. And while I am pleased to see in the programme for government that one of the 14 bills to be introduced in 2023-24 is a Scottish Law Commission bill, a rate of one bill per year, is hardly making significant roads into that backlog. And I think the reason for that is clear, presiding officer. For too long, this government has been interested um, uh, more in the, the work of grievance rather than in the work of governance. Um, I doubt if this bill, when it passes, it passes into legislation, will earn the First Minister or his government a front page splash. I would say that actually having a functioning legal system that governs these kind of areas is actually critical, though, to one of what we are told is the key drivers of this government. A proper growing economy requires a stable and working and interpretable legal system where people can actually uh, govern their own affairs. But this is the hard uh, work of governing. Uh, we do have a chance in this legislation to make some people's lives better. And the parents using a trust to provide for an adult child who can't provide for themselves. The bereaved spouse spared the burden of financial uncertainty. The trustees of a charity who find it that bit easier to administer funds and help those in need. Those people are not asking their government for headline grabbing high stakes legislation with 11th hour votes and controversies. They're asking for competence, compassion, and dignity. They're asking for a serious, hard-working government. Thank you. And I call on Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I thank uh, all members uh, for taking part in this debate this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank the Law Commission uh, for the clerks to the committee and to those that gave evidence to the committee for uh, all they have put before us. Um, as Oliver Mandel said in his speech, we are on this side uh, will be supporting uh, this bill at stage one. But I do think there's a lot of work that needs to be done at stage two and three. And I do think there's quite a lot of heavy lifting that the Scottish Government still have to do. I absolutely agree that trust law does need changing. There can't be any other area of law that both my grandfather, my father and myself all were taught the same thing. Um, at university. For it to be three generations, if not four generations old, shows that it is time for reform. I am disappointed, I have to say, in regard to the government's response around succession law. There is general agreement, both within the legal profession and within academia, that this is tinkering 
with the system. This was an opportunity to bring forward major reform in regard to succession law. And for whatever reason, the Scottish Government have decided not to take that opportunity. The Minister, in her response to the committee report, has said that there will be no further uh, change in our succession law within this parliamentary session. Now, I fully accept that to change succession law would be controversial, that there is no major agreement out there. But surely the role of government is to lead. And this was an opportunity for us to reform succession law to bring it into the 21st century. Instead, we are tinkering on the edges of it and we are simply bringing forward two areas rather than major reform. And I think that is disappointment. A great answer to this, I don't know, but I've listened for some time now to him telling the Chamber how we're not doing enough and we're just tinkering, but can he just tell us what it is he wants in the Bill and why he's not brought amendments about it? Or? Jeremy Balfour. Well, uh, this is stage one, so stage two is still to come. But the intention was, well, I would encourage the member to go and read the evidence that was given to us, particularly by the uh, professors of law from Dundee. And uh, the issue I have is that success in law needs to be brought into the 21st century, and it simply isn't. And if you simply go and look at what has been said, both by the Law Commission and by the academics, I think that is absolutely clear. Can I... Bob Doris. Oh, um, Martin Whitfield. <laughs> I'm, I'm very grateful to Jeremy Balfour to give way, and I'm in no way defending the Scottish Government or the choice, but this came about, but this came about because of the Scottish Law Commission Bill, for which there is particularly provisions within the standing orders that if the bill matches certain criteria, interestingly one of which is that it won't um, generate substantial controversy, it proceeds through in a, in, a, in a different and one would hope more streamlined way. That's not to take away from the very valid points that may need to be looked at, but perhaps this is not the vehicle that we would have expected that to happen in. Jeremy Bartlett. Well, I, 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 I think that was an interesting question, which is interesting for debate. But what is clear is that succession law needs to be reformed. That this government has had 14 years to do that. They had an opportunity either in this bill or in another piece of legislation to bring forward. And we've been told by them that they're not going to touch it for another at least two and a half years. If I can move on to the area of um, the trust law, um, I think there are a number of areas that we do need to seek clarification on and we'll need to seek amendment as it goes through. If I can point out just a few of those. Firstly, I think there is a danger, and a number of speakers have pointed to this, that we put people off becoming trustees of trust. Now, there is already evidence out there that it's becoming harder to find trustees for certain trusts to do that work, particularly small trusts, which do a really important uh, role within local communities. And I think we just have to be careful that we don't put people off. Or the perception is, and it, perhaps it's more a perception, that there are financial problems you could face yourself if you become a trustee. And I think it would be helpful for the Minister to bring forward amendments to clarify that at stage two. The second area, and I think this is one that all members of the committee have uh, struggled with, and I think we will still have to think more, and I, I think the government are already thinking about this, is in regard to the definition of what it means for incapacity. Um, there is no clear way forward. Um, I think Emma Harper and Oliver Mandel have raised this issue in the debate, um, and I think we just have to be really careful again that whatever definition we ultimately come to as a parliament, that we are confident that it will meet not just the lawyers need, but actually more important, the trustees need, particularly where they are small trust and don't want to keep going to lawyers. Uh, certain. Jeremy McMillan. Thank Jeremy Balfour for taking the intervention. I think uh, Mr Balfour will also agree that uh, as a committee we had considered the point of future proofing of this, so some type of uh, mechanism as a delegated power would certainly help with that. Jeremy yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, with me, Mr McMillan, I think that may be a way forward, um, but I think it's again something we just have to look at. The 
I, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Kerr to some degree that people should be making um, a will. However, I would remind Mr. Kerr of a great advert that the Law Society brought forward in the 1990s, that it's never too early to call a solicitor. And obviously that is same true uh, today. But we do have to make sure that Mr. Kerr is right, that the language isn't simply good for lawyers, but it is good for those who are working on trust day in, day out, so that we don't get caught out. If we can avoid lawyers being involved in things, that can only be good news. Can I agree absolutely um, with Martin Whitfield in, his, in regard to his concerns he has raised about the interplay between trusts and charities? Um, I raised a number of questions to the expert witnesses around that. And again, I think we just need to be clear in our thinking of how we're going to proceed. Um, finally, you'd be glad to hear, presiding officer, uh, I do think we need to look again at codification raised by Mr. Kerr and Mr. Wheatfield again. Um, we have waited 100 years to have this bill uh, come through. Um, we could probably wait just a wee bit longer if it is simply a time issue that the Minister is concerned about. I think we can pause and wait to do that. If there is more of a substantial reason why she thinks that's not possible, I would be interested to hear that. Uh, uh, President Officer, this is a bill that is long overdue. Uh, it will be welcomed both by civic society and by the legal profession, and I look forward to voting uh, for it at stage one tonight. Thank you, and I call on Siobhan. Oh, point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, Mark Whitfield's uh, speech, he made a declaration of interest. I should also have made a declaration of interest as a trustee of a charity registered in England, a human rights charity, uh, and I want to put that on the record for any, uh, just in case there's any doubt. Thank you, Mr Kerr. While it's not a point of order, it is on the record. And I call the Minister to wind up the debate to 5pm, please, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank all the members for their contributions to this afternoon's really helpful debate. I'd also like to repeat my thanks to the Scottish Law Commission for the decade of work which has gone into the, this reform project. And I thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for the work they have done gathering and listening to the evidence on the bill and for the recommendations. In general, the bill covers the powers and duties of trustees, the administrations of trusts, the powers of the courts in trust matters, and one substantive provision on succession. The majority of the current statutory framework relating to the trust law is found in the Trust Scotland Act 1921. In modern trust practice, the powers and duties of trustees are markedly different to those set out in the 1921 Act. The part played by the trust in commercial structures, for instance, means that the trust law is of economic importance. Trusts are widely used for investment and for financial planning. Other examples of the use of trusts include supporting those who are unable to manage their own affairs due to, for example, as I mentioned, being underage or having a disability, to ring fence funds to ensure consumer protection, for instance, travel companies holding funds provided for holidays, or to hold business or other assets rather than fragmenting ownership. Current legislation has not kept up with how trusts are now used, and this bill represents a significant step to bringing the law up to date, making it easier for trustees, trustees, beneficiaries to understand what their legal rights and duties are. The SLC's reform project is the most significant review of the Scots law of trust in the last 100 years, and this bill implements the overwhelming number of recommendations made by it. I think the SLC's recommendations overall achieve the aim of modernising trust law, but committees, committee and members here today have identified some points of detail where they consider that improvements can be made on the bill. And I'm pleased, however, that although there are these points of debate, there is a broad support across the chamber for the general principles of the bill. I've listened to each of the points. If I could just get on, I've got a lot to get on. Sorry, Mr Kerr. The points raised by the committee carefully, and I will, take, I will, of course, take these away and reflect on them before stage two. I'm willing to listen to and where I can work with members across the chamber of this bill. Earlier, I touched on the environmental, social and governance investing, expenses of litigation and the definition of incapable and unlawful killers and assuming the office of ex executor to the victims of the state. And I'd like to use the rest of the time to 
bring up a few other issues that were raised today by members. First of all, codification has been brought up by several members today. Um, complete codification of any area of law is never straightforward work. Um, the SLC considered codification of the law, but ultimately rejected it. Its views, as Lord Drummond Young told the committee, was that some areas of the law were better left out of statute. For example, that somewhat abstract dual patrimony theory, which underpins trust and the law around express trust or implied trusts. The bill does reform all the parts of Scots trust law, which has traditionally been dealt with by statute. It consolidates and modernises nearly all the statutory trust law. I'm content that the SLC has, after extensive consideration of this issue, identified the right approach to the bill, focusing on reforming the parts of the law which create problems in practice. I understand the view of the committee that a comprehensive codification would make it uh, easier for a layperson to access and understand the legislation. But as the SLC suggested in evidence, in other jurisdictions <coughs> where codification has taken place, the statutory law is seldom absolutely comprehensive. If I may move on to presiding office section 104, which has been raised by several members as well. It is critically important that the bill does not leave pension trusts behind. That is why the preferred route to achieve maximum certainty is to work with the UK government to bring forward an order under section 104 of the Scotland Act, which will apply the bill to pensions trusts. We've had positive engagement with officials at the Scotland office and other UK government departments, and we're making progress to take on taking forward the Section 104 order. And we're at a really early stage of the process, but I'll continue to update the committee as and when the issue develops. I know Oliver Mundell did, in his um, contribution, touch on expenses of litigation. Currently, it is usually the, the case that trustees are personally liable to pay litigation expenses to successful opponents that have the right of relief against a trust estate. I've, I've listened to the concerns raised in particular by the Law Society about the potential effect of these provisions, and my officials met with them and stepped over the summer to hear directly from them. But I, I am going to look into this matter again and consider how we best might deal with the concerns raised by some of the professions. Willie Coffey raised the emotive issue regarding um, executors, uh, Burda's executors, and I am really committed to bringing forward reform that would prevent a person convicted of murder from being an executor to their victim's estate, and my officials and I will continue to explore what can be done in the context of the bill to ensure this. Now, moving on to the definition of incapacity, which I know several members have, have raised. The bill uses a familiar definition of incapable, which is very similar, but it's not identical to the one that is found in the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000. The committee has rightly pointed out that there are significant and far-reaching changes recommended to the mental health legislation. And I agree it would be clearly undesirable for the meaning of incapable in trust law to differ from the usual widely understood definition. I could see merit in making sure that the bill does not diverge from the general law on capacity and that it will keep pace with any changes in the area. I am considering the best approach with a view to bringing forward an amendment at stage two in relation to this. Presiding officer, one very important point that was raised by Mr Kerr in his speech um, that I would fully endorse uh, is the importance of making a will. Making a will is the only way to make sure your money, your property, your possessions and your investments go to the people that you really care about. Okay. Yes, Mr. Kerr. Stephen Kerr. I wonder if the Minister might be minded to consider whether or not we could have a fundamental change in the way that properties are registered so that you would have to have a notarised will so that the disposal of the property in the event of the death of the owner would be you know, wound up in the whole transaction. Minister. Thank you, Mr Kerr, for the intervention. I, I could be something that we could consider. It's not going to be considered in this specific bill. Presiding officer, I believe that today's debate reinforces the impression that there is a broad support for the bill and its policy aims. This is Parliament's chance to consider an area of law which has not been looked at 
in any substance for over 100 years. As a whole, the bill seeks to bring, in, bring the law into line with modern practice and it takes forward all the substantive recommendations for reform proposed by the SLC. I'd like to thank all the members who have contributed to today's debate and I welcome your broad support for the general principles of the bill. As the debate has indicated, though, there are matters to consider and some differences of view on some of the points of detail. I have committed to writing to the committee ahead of stage two and providing further information that it has requested, and I look forward to working with the committee and members from across the chamber to consider these issues in coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill at stage one. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. And there is one item, one question to be put as a result of today's business. And the question is that motion 10595 in the name of Siobhan Brown on Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>